Hello, it is Tuesday, June the 30th, 2020. The year is halfway over already, and today's devotion begins with a reading from the book of Acts in the ninth chapter. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he responded. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were approaching here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The man seemed beyond redemption. His crimes included eight shootings, killing six, and starting nearly 1,500 fires that terrorized New York City in the 1970s. He left letters at his crime scenes, taunting the police, and he was eventually apprehended and given consecutive sentences of 25 years to life for each murder. Yet God reached down to this man. Today he is a believer in Christ, who spends time daily in the scriptures, has expressed deep regret to his victims' families, and continues to pray for them. Although imprisoned for more than four decades, this man who seemed beyond redemption finds hope in God and claims, My freedom is found in one word, Jesus. Scripture tells of another unlikely conversion. Before he met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Yet Paul's heart and life were transformed by Jesus, and he became one of the most powerful witnesses for Christ in human history. The man who once plotted the death of Christians devoted his life to spreading the hope of the gospel. Redemption is always a miraculous work of God. Some stories are more dramatic than others, but the underlying truth remains the same. None of us deserve his forgiveness, yet Jesus is a powerful Savior. He saved those who come completely come to God through him, or rather, he saves completely those who come to God through him. This devotion was written by James Banks. Did God really forgive a serial killer and arsonist? Did God really forgive this person and call him to be a witness to the Christian faith? Writing to families of his victims, expressing his deep remorse? and praying for them? How is that even possible? Surely this man's actions are beyond forgiveness. Surely God doesn't extend forgiveness or, or salvation 
to someone who has committed such heinous crimes? Does he? Pastor Anley, Andy Stanley wrote a short book with a very thought-provoking title. Since nobody's perfect, how good is good enough? In other words, since none of us is perfect, how good do we have to be in order to be acceptable to God? How good do we have to be in order to be worthy of admittance into heaven? How good do we have to be in order to be worthy of God's promise of forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? Well, this is really a trick question, and it's one that frequently trips up Christians. Nobody's perfect, period. And thanks be to God, our salvation, my salvation, is not dependent on how good I may or may not have been, on how many sins I may have committed, or the severity of those sins. Yes, I am a sinner. Every day I sin and fall short of the glory of God, as Paul writes in Romans 3, verse 23. And thanks be to God that my sins, all of them, regardless of what they may be, all of my sins are forgiven through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that God does not count those sins against me. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. Amen. Let us pray. Forgive us, O God. By your boundless grace, forgive us our sins and give us the grace to forgive those who sin against us. We pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of your life-giving Holy Spirit. Amen.